day, and welcome to the GEO Institute Technical Committee's web conference. Today's topic is earthquake engineering and soil dynamics. This is an audio web conference. You will hear the presentation through your computer speakers, and there will be a PowerPoint presentation that will be shown throughout the meeting. You can ask a question through the online web conference tool at any point during the session by clicking on the Ask Question button on the left of your screen. Type your question into the box and hit Submit to send the question. I'd now like to turn the floor over to today's facilitator, Ashley Morales Cartagena. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the ASCE Geo Institute Earthquake Engineering and Soil Dynamics Technical Committee, welcome to the 2018 Earthquake Engineering and Soil Dynamics Web Conference. My name is Ashley Morales Cartagena from the Pontificia Universidad Católica in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, and it is my pleasure to serve today as your facilitator. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Guillermo Diaz Fañas from WSP for organizing this webinar. Also, Professor James Glacanos from Marymount College, who served with me as an abstract reviewer. Professor Scott Vandenberg, chair of the ESD committee. Diane Swecker for serving as the GI liaison to coordinate the webinar. And all the GI and ASC staff who have supported us to bring this presentation today. Also, we would like to thank our gold sponsor, Keller. The connected companies of Keller in North America are uniquely positioned to handle the most complex geotechnical construction projects nationwide. By including all services in one contract, we reduce client risk and ensure all aspects of a project are met on time and on budget. So this is today's lineup for the lecture, and without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker is Dr. Christine Beisai. She works with SAGE engineers in Oakland, California. She has a geotechnical and earthquake engineering experience in the U.S. and internationally. Dr. Beisai's practical experience includes geotechnical field investigation and analysis, geoseismic testing and analysis, and research and the, of the application of the state-of-the-art methods for practical solutions and product implementation. She completed her PhD at the University of California, Berkeley in 2017. From 2010 to 2013, she worked as a geotechnical engineer at Muser Village Consulting Engineers in New York City. In addition to her academic and professional pursuits, the Teresa is really active in the geotechnical engineering community. She works through the ERI, the Earth Engineering Research Institute, also to GEAR, through GEAR, the Geotechnical Extreme Event Reconnaissance Association, and she volunteers mentoring high school students with the ACE Mentor Program of America, in addition to her involvement with the ACE. So, Dr. Beisai, please join us for your presentation. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Ashley. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I'll have to assume yes. Um, today I'll be discussing liquefaction effects at silty soil sites through case history from Christchurch, New Zealand. The work being presented today was part of a broader effort by the research team listed below and was supported by many agencies and organizations in both the U.S. and New Zealand. So during the 2010-2011 Canterbury earthquake sequence, liquefaction damage devastated the city of Christchurch, New Zealand. And for many sites throughout Christchurch, state of practice methods indicated that liquefaction would be expected, and during post-earthquake reconnaissance, liquefaction was indeed observed, such as at the site shown here. However, there were also many sites, predominantly silty soil sites, where state of practice methods indicated liquefaction would be expected, but during post-earthquake reconnaissance, no surface manifestations of liquefaction were observed, such as at the site shown here. And it was really this discrepancy between the state of practice liquefaction estimations and post-earthquake observations that led to the development of the case histories I'll be discussing today. So the state of practice liquefaction assessment procedures um, are empirically based and have all been built on underlying case histories. 
These have typically focused on clean sand sites, and as such, laboratory testing has also tended to focus on sands. So the silty soil sites being considered today really do differ from the majority of the case history database. Looking at the Bull and Jane Idris 2014 method, for example, of the 253 cases in that database, fewer than 15% of these case histories have signs contents greater than 35%. So because um, we're using methodologies that are based on sandy sites, our silty soil sites really do differ. Um, and an additional point is that um, these case histories have all been developed from surface manifestations following earthquakes, so doing field reconnaissance, observing at the ground surface. So when we look at the triggering procedures and we say liquefaction or no liquefaction, we're really implicitly pairing the triggering and the um, post-earthquake surface manifestation. So the case histories discussed today will fill two gaps in our empirical databases, one being that there are no liquefaction sites and two being that they're silty soil sites. The Canterbury earthquake sequence provides an unprecedented opportunity for us to evaluate our current procedures and develop further case histories. It consisted of four main events um, shown here with extensive documentation of both the post-earthquake observations and subsurface investigations through the development of the New Zealand Geotechnical Database, which is a great resource and is publicly available, so I encourage you to check it out. Uh, today we'll be focusing on observations from the 2011 Christchurch earthquake, which caused severe and pervasive liquefaction throughout Christchurch, as indicated in this figure with the yellow and orange shading. However, throughout much of southwest Christchurch, as you can see in the white shaded areas, no liquefaction manifestations were observed, despite state of practice methods indicating liquefaction would be expected. And this is the area where we focused our study. We selected six silty soil sites throughout Southwest Christchurch for in-depth investigations, and we also selected three sand sites from along the Avon River where liquefaction was both expected and post-earthquake liquefaction manifestations were observed. Um, these sand sites acted as a comparison point for our investigations at the silty soil sites. So shown here are the CPT profiles looking at QC and ICC for the six silty soil sites and one clean sand site for comparison. Um, these are silt dominant profiles and as you get to site 14, which is um, next to the EQC3 clean sand site on the right, you can see that the site 14 site has what could be considered to be closest to a typical sandy liquefaction profile. Um, five of the six silty soil sites, those on the left, had no surface manifestations of liquefaction following the Christchurch event, whereas the one silty soil site that did have a closer to a sand, um, to a typical sand profile did demonstrate liquefaction um, during the 2011 Christchurch earthquake. So we have a set of sites that are not well represented in the empirical data sets, both through um, the sort of silty soil dominant nature of their profiles, as well as you'll notice some significant interlayering, particularly at site 23. And they're also not well captured by our available methods with no surface evidence of liquefaction. So how do we go about investigating these sites? Um, our goals for this research were first and foremost to understand the discrepancy between state of practice triggering procedures and post-earthquake observations. We began by conducting field sampling and tested these soils in the laboratory to assess their seismic response and resistance, in addition to evaluating the possibility for other contributing factors. In doing so, we were developing no liquefaction case histories for integration into the next generation liquefaction data set. And in working with practicing engineers from both the U.S. and New Zealand throughout this process, we are also providing additional guidance on evaluating the seismic response of these soils for our partner practicing engineers. Our Christchurch field investigations began in 2014, looking at preliminary site characterization through 
sonic borings, CPTs, cross-hole seismic, which is conducted by UT Austin, as well as high-quality sampling to obtain specimens for cyclic triac field testing. In 2016, we were able to return to three sites based on the findings of our 2014 investigation to conduct an in-depth site characterization using high-quality sampling and mini CPTs, in addition to a detailed logging program on the high-quality samples. And this was really made possible through the excellent research team that we were working with, as well as the um, cooperative nature and generosity of some of the site owners that we were working with in New Zealand, who allowed us two years later to come back and do additional investigations at those sites. The high-quality sampling was conducted using the Danes & Moore sampling device, which is a hydraulic fixed piston sampler that utilizes thin walled constant diameter brass sample tubes to reduce disturbance. Um, we opted to do the drilling using case mud rotary borings with a side discharge tricone roller bit to further minimize disturbance to the soils being sampled. Taking a moment for the slide to load. Um, Cyclic track field testing was then conducted at the University of Canterbury Laboratory using a testing device shown in this photo. And we wanted to do the testing in Canterbury to minimize any disturbance that would be caused by transportation to these samples. Uh, looking at the results of our cyclic triaxial testing, we evaluated axial strain development versus number of cycles to establish cyclic resistance curves at each site. And then from these resistance curves, we then developed laboratory-based estimates of cyclic resistance for comparison with our state of practice method estimates. So in looking at a liquefaction assessment comparison, looking at our laboratory data versus state of practice predictions, for this site, we had an estimated CR from laboratory testing of around 0.19, compared with an estimated CR from the Bull and Jay and Idris 2014 method of around 0.16. So comparing the laboratory data with our state of practice estimates, we get relatively comparable or reasonable results. However, in comparing both estimates of CRR to the estimate of CSR, we see that both are still well below um, the estimated seismic demand at the site and leads to factor of safety is around a half for this site. So um, when we compare with no surface manifestations of liquefaction at this site, we're still left with some questions. Another interesting finding from the cyclic track field testing program was in observed differences in the post-liquefaction reconsolidation response. Um, looking at the slide on the, looking at the figure, the plot on the left, which shows non-plastic and low plasticity silt on the order of PI2, you can see that the post liquefaction reconsolidation has a um, near immediate reaching a final volumetric strain. As compared with the graph on the right, which shows non-plastic and low plasticity silt up to around four to nine, that as we get up to PIs of even around four or five, we begin seeing this time-dependent reconsolidation response. And this will have direct implications for in-situ field response as well as the potential for hydraulic connectivity and ejecta formation, which again has implications for settlement and field observation. So in terms of explaining the overprediction, um, we took a look at the laboratory testing as well as what we learned from the field investigations using multiple investigation techniques and came up with several factors that might be contributing, such as groundwater table fluctuation and the occurrence of an overlying non-liquefiable crust that serves to cap the site, as well as the highly stratified subsurface profiles at some of these sites, which could lead to at the suppression of ejecta movement and that time-dependent reconsolidation. Additionally, uh, the sand and silt particles at a lot of these sites in Christchurch are quite angular, which can have a mitigating effect. And the inherent conservatism in our analysis approach is always something that must be considered. Or is it some combination of all of the above? Because again, several factors working together, and when you're starting from the point of no observations, you really have to look at every contributing factor and try and characterize it to determine how it might have contributed to the observed response. Um, so in looking at all these things, we began to think that it's something to do with the scale of the problem, and we wanted to consider the macro scale system response as opposed to the element or specimen or particle level response.
So we took a step back and, looking at the bigger picture, began investigating the depositional environment throughout Southwest Christchurch. We looked at the geomorphology, historical maps, photos from when Christchurch was founded, as well as detailed blogging. In looking at this historical map of Christchurch, it became clear that the silty soil sites with no surface manifestations of liquefaction were in or adjacent to swamp zones in southwest Christchurch, while the silty soil site that did show liquefaction manifestations was far from one of these silty back swamps in all directions. So giving us this clue as to what might be going on in southwest Christchurch and differentiating between these silty soil sites, we wanted to try and assess and quantify this effect on the regional scale. So we compared land damage observations, which are really um, observations of liquefaction at the ground surface, with LSN estimates throughout Christchurch. And LSN is an index similar to LPI. Um, we went through and recognizing the differences in eastern Christchurch, which is really more of a coastal area from western Christchurch, we separated the city into east and west and then also separated out these swamp zones that are outlined here, shown below. So because of the wealth of data that was available in the New Zealand Geotechnical Database, we were really able to do this kind of regional assessment rather than having individual points from where borings have been done and interpolate over 25 meter by 25 meter tiles, which also ha helped us to avoid CPT density bias in more heavily investigated areas. So the results of this regional assessment are shown here, and we're looking at all areas outside of swamp areas, the eastern swamp areas, and then the western swamp areas. And in the areas that are closer to a typical liquefaction profile, which are sandier in nature, we see that all areas outside of swamp areas and the eastern swamp areas both show the trends that we would expect, that as LSN increases, you also see higher, you see more surface observations of liquefaction. However, in the western swamp areas, we see that LSN and our simplified methods don't do a great job of differentiating between areas where liquefaction is and is not observed, in addition to representing an overall sort of overprediction of liquefaction manifestations. Um, going beyond the regional assessment and looking at a site-specific comparison, we compared Site 33, which had no surface manifestations of liquefaction, with Site 14, which did. And in looking at the subsurface profiles and liquefaction assessment results, we see no clear indication or cause of the differences in post-earthquake liquefaction observations in looking at these two profiles. However, when we look at the detailed logging, we see clear differences in stratigraphy resulting from differences in their depositional environments. And within the swamp site, showing silt seams and layering as compared with the site 14, which has more of an overall silty sand matrix, we see that these seams will have the potential to really impact hydraulic connectivity and ejecta formation as compared to the thicker silty sand matrix at site 14, which would really allow a lot of ejecta to begin moving towards the ground surface and manifest as was observed during post-earthquake reconnaissance. So seems like a trivial conclusion. Um, geology is important, but depositional environment does matter. And by considering it, especially through this more quantified manner, we can capture effects that are missed by the simplified methods. The importance of geology has been recognized previously, but it's not currently considered in our simplified methods in a direct manner. And data that's available following recent reconnaissance efforts really allows quantification of these effects. So looking at um, how we can characterize some of these details that we know might have an impact for liquefaction response in the field, we looked at sonic borings and high quality sampling to assess thin layer stratigraphy. And while sonic borings are useful for general characterization and bulk sampling, they do cause significant disturbance to soil cores, um, especially in the sand layers that are most of concern for liquefaction assessment. So if you're comparing uh, if you're interested in obtaining the level of detail that might be necessary for critical sites or more in-depth evaluations, doing detailed logging is really the way to go. 
We also looked at assessing the conventional CPT compared with the mini CPT, and we used a 5 centimeter square mini CPT in an attempt to um, decrease the zone of influence and get more resolution on what the data being obtained by the CPT. So shown here, the black underlying lines are the standard CPTs, and the overlying warm colored lines are the mini CPTs. And, and while we see that the mini CPT overall shows the same general layering, it does add a little bit more detail, but in terms of the two issues of concern, which were smearing over, the, over, those, um, over those layering sequences and identifying the actual scale of the layering that's occurring in situ, um, we see that the mini CPT, at least using the five centimeter square one, doesn't really provide us with too much additional level of detail. Um, and in addition, this is a sort of actual field use of the mini CPT. We did note that, of course, it was more difficult to obtain um, somebody who was able to go out and push the CPTs in the field. And we did note that because the equipment was less frequently used, there were some issues with the electrical system, connectivity, and all of that that would have to be considered for a project implementation. Doing a direct investigation technique comparison, looking at the CPTs, mini CPTs, the detailed logging from the high quality sample, as well as from the, uh, as well as the sonic boring core sample, we see that the CPT and mini CPT both kind of smear over the layering sequence that's observed in the high quality sample, which you would expect. Um, the zone of influence for the five centimeters square cone, while smaller than that for the standard cone, is still on the order of possibly 10 centimeters, 12, 15 centimeters, whereas the layering that we observed at these sites is really on the order of one to two centimeters, if not millimeters. Um, so it's just at a very, very fine scale. Something interesting that came out of this direct comparison and doing the detailed logging program is in looking at the fines content versus I sub C correlation that's often used in liquefaction assessment. And we specifically compared again with the Boulanger and Idris, with the Boulanger and Idris methodology. Um, and in looking at these, in looking at these figures, just take a moment and think about the scale at which we typically do sampling um, for our investigations and how the sample is prepared in doing our science content estimate. So in looking at the high quality sample, you can see that really the scale of layering is on the order of millimeters and centimeters. And so when you're taking a bulk sample or a grab sample, depending on how that is being sampled and how it's even being prepared for laboratory testing of science contents, you could obtain very different results especially when compared with the CBT, which is smearing over and kind of averaging all of that information in the first place. Um, so for these interlayered sites, science content ICC correlation doesn't work as well as it does in a more homogeneous deposit. I'd also briefly mentioned, gr mentioned groundwater table effects. We looked at multiple techniques to obtain a robust understanding of groundwater conditions at each of the case history sites um, using several of the techniques that we'd already looked at for stratigraphy investigation. So looking at sonic borings and continuous sampling, we were able to look at iron staining in those cores and see where depths to iron staining ceased was kind of the deepest that we estimated the groundwater table had fluctuated to. We are also able to look at P wave velocities from the UT Austin cross hole seismic testing to get an estimate of the depth to 100% saturation. And at each case history site, we looked at all these pieces of information, um, including, of course, piezometer data from the New Zealand Geotechnical Database, to obtain a full picture of groundwater conditions at these sites and how that might be contributing um, to the post earthquake liquefaction observations. So this is all really great for developing case histories, and we're able to spend the time and effort to investigate all these different effects. But you're probably wondering how does this relate to the tools that we currently have available in practice. Um, I've discussed triggering procedures, and those go along with settlement estimates. 
And I think the two most relevant additional things that we can think about for these types of sites are thin layer corrections and the Ishihara 1985 surface manifestation assessment. So the thin layer corrections really was developed based on a thin layer sandwiched between two thick, softer layers. Um, and at our sites, rather than having one layer with a high contrast of thickness between two other layers, we have an interlayered sequence where there isn't necessarily that stark stiffness contrast between the two. Um, additionally, the thin layer corrections were developed for, um, are typically applied for layers on the order of 20 to 30 centimeters. And again, as I've described and shown, we were looking at layers on the order of 1 to 2 centimeters at most really up to 10, maybe 15 centimeters. So we're really at the lower bound of where those curves were developed for and are pushing that boundary. Um, looking at the surface manifestations, we again see that for the thicknesses of our overlying non-liquefiable layer and our underlying liquefiable layer, we see that we're again at the boundary and at the bottom of where those curves were developed for, possibly extrapolating beyond the data for which these things were based. In addition to the surface manifestations assessment really requiring significant judgment when you have these types of interlayered sites in terms of deciding what's going to be counted towards your liquefiable versus non-liquefiable layers. Um, but the, so the main takeaway from this is that we should be utilizing all of these tools that are available. Uh, many are implemented in CELIC and are user-friendly, so we should be seeing if they're available and can be employed in the analysis at a site. Um, the silty soil sites discussed today are still in areas that are not well constrained by these empirical procedures, and it really underscores the importance of developing and analyzing these case histories so that we can implement them in the empirical databases. So in conclusion, I'd just like to summarize by saying that depositional environment is going to indicate if your site conforms to these clean sand liquefaction methodologies and should be considered before um, just going and applying, dropping the CPT profiles into your, assess, into your analysis tool. Um, appropriate site characterization is going to allow for a more thorough understanding of in-situ conditions. And laboratory testing can be used to target critical layers once site characterization has been established. Although, as you can see, the cyclic response of silty soils, especially interlayered silty soils, is nuanced, and it's difficult to broadly categorize. It's really important to note that the sites discussed today were free field silty soil sites, with at most um, one to two story light construction buildings. And they potentially could have shown liquefaction manifestations if large buildings had been present, such as was observed in Adipazari, Turkey, or if they were shaken harder. And hopefully through the many factors described today, I've helped you understand why um, system response is really key and that's the direction we're moving in. So deciding if simplified methods are applicable, then you can use the above considerations to gain information and data to apply engineering judgment and move forward with alternative assessment methods. And hopefully through all of this discussed today for these Silky Soil Christchurch sites, you can see why a holistic approach is needed with consideration of many interrelated factors that will affect performance. So with that, um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening, and a really big thank you to the many agencies that supported this research, as well as my time in the doctoral program at UC Berkeley, which is where this work was conducted. Um, I'd also like to thank my current employer, Sage Engineers, for supporting the time for me to participate in this presentation today. So with that, I'll say thank you and pass it back over to Ashley. Thank you, Christine, for your wonderful presentation. We only have time for two questions, and we, got, we have two questions from our attendees. I'm going to ask the first question, so you answer, and then I'm, I'll answer the other one. If, you, any, if any of you have another question, please type it in the Q&A um, window, and we'll mail it directly to Christine, and she'll reply back to you. So the first question is, can you elaborate further on the detailed sampling and how that relates to the fine content to the IC correlation? Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try and skip back through the slides, so hopefully that'll show up for everyone. Okay. 
So the science content I, I could see correlation is something that's used in the liquefaction assessment procedures, um, and that links your I could see with um, an estimate of science content if you don't actually have um, laboratory testing to support that. Um, and those are correlations that have been developed based on available data sets. But what we found for these interlayered sites is that how the samples are taken and the depth interval of, that's being sampled will obviously have a big impact on how that relates to the ICC. And for instance, um, hopefully everyone can see the slide that I've switched back to. If you have a significant layering sequence that's being mixed together, you're completely losing the detail on that layering sequence, and depending on where you're actually sampling from, could come up with very different estimates of science content. For example, for some of our cyclic triaxial specimens, we were able to split them into different parts after testing and do science content estimates on each of those parts. And when we compared, for instance, the top, middle, and bottom to the correlation, we see that although maybe the bottom of the specimen matched well, the top and middle science content estimates are way off from the correlation. So in these interlayer deposits, it's really not um, the best way of estimating and doing that correlation. Um, and this is a very, this is sort of going off on a tangent, but um, looking at the different ways of estimating science contents, I think recently there's been some move towards using um, laser diffraction estimates of science contents. And depending on how that's calibrated, and you're taking a very small subsample for that, um, you can get somewhat different shapes of the gradation curves as compared to doing a sieve hydrometer analysis. So that's one more factor that should be considered when you're doing these types of correlations. And the main goal is just in developing these case histories to be as detailed as possible so that when we eventually do have to average things for implementation and practice and analysis and come up with correlations, we have a clear understanding of what they're based on. Hopefully that answered the question. Okay. Yeah, I think if they have any other doubt, they'll directly send it to us. Okay. And I think we're going to move to the next presentation. Okay. Thank you, Christine. It was wonderful. Okay. So our next presenters are Dr. Manny Hakamaneshi and Dr. Erica Fisher, and they are going to talk about the uh, using the virtual technologies to perform disaster reconnaissance in your technical engineering case histories. Dr. Erica Fisher is an assistant professor at the Oregon State University in the School of Civil and Construction Engineering. Dr. Fisher's research interests revolve around innovative approaches to improve the resilience and robustness of structural systems affected by natural and man-made hazards. This includes performance-based design approaches of structural systems to decrease the environmental impact of the built environment on the natural environment. Dr. Fisher's focus is on steel and composite systems and connections. These research interests are implemented through both large-scale experimental testing and numerical modeling approaches. Dr. Fisher is a member of a number of committees, including the ASCE SEI Fire Protection Committee, ASCE SEI Sustainability Committee, and she's one of the co-founders of the ERI Virtual Earthquake Reconnaissance Team, BIRD. She has been a member of a number of, of post-earthquake reconnaissance team missions, including Haiti 2010, Napa 2014, Italy 2016, and Mexico 2017. Dr. Fisher is a licensed professional engineer in the states of California and Washington and has over five years of experience practicing in structural engineering in Seattle. Um, Dr. Manny Hakamaneshi uh, obtained his PhD from the University of California, Davis, where his research focused on implementation of innovative techniques for a retrofit of existing buildings. A published researcher and registered civil engineer in California, Manny has most recently been working as a design engineer for A. McFoster Wheeler in Oakland since 2016. As a graduate student, he was very active in the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute with the UC Davis ERI student chapter and the Student Leadership Council. Upon obtaining his PhD, Manny joined the ERI Younger, Younger Members Committee and he served as as its co-chair with Erica Fisher. During this three-year period, the youngest member were integrated into the panel presentations of ERI's annual meeting. Dr. Hakemaneshi currently serves 
with Dr. Fisher as the co-chair, co-chair of the Virtual Earthquake Reconnaissance Team BIRT, bringing together graduate students, early career professionals, and young faculty to contribute to post-earthquake reconnaissance through ERI Learning from Earthquakes LFE program. So please join us, um, Dr. Hagamanashi and Dr. Fisher, for your presentation. Thank you, Ashley. So we're going to switch gears a little bit um, right now and talk about a new initiative through um, ERI called the Virtual Earthquake Reconnaissance Team and how this team is able to use virtual technologies to perform disaster reconnaissance. I'm going to give a bit of an overview to this um, initiative and to this program, and then Nanny is going to take over and talk about specific case studies that we've um, been successful in implementing this on. And so um, just kind of to start, I, I wanted to go over post-extreme event field reconnaissance. Um, and and this, this sort of science of, of Reconnaissance um, is the process of quickly conducting damage assessments in a region affected by extreme events. Typically, uh, we, uh, the, the field of earthquake re uh, reconnaissance or post-extreme event reconnaissance sends multidisciplinary teams into the field, which means uh, social scientists, geotechnical engineers, structural engineers, and seismologists are working together in the field in order to document the, uh, and observe damage to um, an effective region. And, and the purpose of it really is to quantify that damage. So take that documentation and these observations and compare them with um, current design standards um, so that we can improve the way that we're, we're designing our infrastructure um, and assess the need for any follow-up research. And so the reason, real reason we, we do a lot of this is, as I mentioned, to validate and verify our design procedures um, so that we can better prepare um, regions of the world for these extreme events. We need to understand what worked and what didn't work in a community and, and really how that, the hazards impacted the community and how the community operates in that, that phase after an extreme event and how they actually utilize their infrastructure. What, what, um, what pieces of infrastructure are most critical to the community in order to operate and recover quickly after a disaster? Um, you know, post-extreme event reconnaissance sometimes highlights new areas of interdependencies amongst our infrastructure um, that we maybe didn't think of during the design phase of our projects. Um, and then lastly, you know, we really just want to facilitate um, resilience and, and future mitigation um, in disaster scenarios. But with everything, there are a lot of challenges. So um, with, with all these, these factors that I'm mentioning, there are a lot of challenges to this field reconnaissance. And, and mainly, it kind of revolves around two, two items, um, first being these multidisciplinary teams. When you have a bunch of um, different disciplines on one team, the time of deployment is, um, is a bit critical. Geotechnical engineers want to get into the field immediately. A lot of the geotechnical impacts are um, cleared right away. Um, you know, if uh, landslides are blocking ro roads or um, there's liquefaction or um, rock falls. These are these are typically cleared immediately so that emergency response teams can get into the affected region. And so it's really critical that geotechnical engineers are on the field um, days or you know within weeks of the of the of the disaster. But structural engineers need to wait until search and rescue is over. Otherwise, emergency response teams won't let them in the building. Um, so they're they're looking at you know weeks to months after the disaster. And then social scientists, it's even more. A lot of times local governments put moratoriums on social science research after a disaster because of the impacts that it could have on the mental health of the community. So social science teams are looking at months um, to almost a year after a disaster to entering the field. And so when you have these multidisciplinary teams, the time of deployment is, becomes a little tricky and complicated and one of the bigger challenges of field reconnaissance. 
And then to actually examine the impact of the hazard on a community. A lot of times affected regions are not physically accessible due to um, road blockages or critical infrastructure being um, down. If a, if a bridge fails and, and people can't actually get to the affected region, um, what happens then and how do we actually collect that perishable data that will help us validate and verify our codes? Uh, field reconnaissance is usually performed over a week to 10 days, um, but it's very difficult to be in the field for longer than that. And so there's limited time and resources to assess every single damaged area. Um, and so how do we pick the, the damaged areas that we think are most critical to actually visit? And then lastly, um, it, you know, it's, it's really important to know where these damaged sites are before, before boots are on the ground. And a lot of the times we don't know where these damaged sites are before we get into the field um, to do the reconnaissance. And so we're very much reliant on local experts um, to tell us where these damaged sites are. And so because of all these challenges, um, Maddie and myself formed what we call the Virtual Earthquake Reconnaissance Team that can help alleviate a lot of these challenges for field reconnaissance teams um, and, and find out this information virtually before teams are getting into the field. And so we, we are part of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute and are sort of nestled in between the Learning from Earthquakes Committee and the Younger Members Committee. We, our members are, are from the Younger Members Committee. We use early career academics, professionals, and graduate students in order to um, populate our team. But we meet the needs of the Learning from Earthquakes Committee. So we, we work um, collaboratively with both. And we wear a number of different hats. Um, so we kind of respond differently uh, after every single event. Um, so it depends on the needs of the ERI community. It depends on the, um, a, the extent of the disaster. And it depends on how um, ERI has determined to respond. And so if any of you have ever used the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute Clearinghouse after an earthquake, it's our team that is actually blogging and curating that clearinghouse. We interface with on-site ERI members when um, field reconnaissance teams are not being sent in um, from the ERI. So any, any, field, any members that are already in the affected region will interface with them to get real-time information. We assist reconnaissance teams in preparing to deploy. They need to understand what the state is that they're entering. Um, they also need to understand what the culture is um, in the region that they're about to enter in order to help them better do field reconnaissance. And then on the back end, we assist the reconnaissance teams as they come back. A lot of reconnaissance teams, the members have full-time jobs. And so um, when they come back with a lot of their data, it takes a really long time to post-process that and share it with the community. And so this, um, we help them post-process their data so that we can expedite that and get, and get that out into the ERI community. And then any potential research projects that come up that help um, members of reconnaissance teams really understand um, what the state of design codes are and, and how previous disasters have affected the change in, um, in codes and standards. And so all of, this, all of this really leads into, into two goals that our, that our team has. The first is to collect that information immediately after a disaster or earthquake to help ERI make informed decisions and help ERI understand um, how they should be responding to this, uh, a particular earthquake. And the second goal is um, to perform virtual earthquake reconnaissance to supplement um, in-field reconnaissance and, and reports that are coming out from the field in order to um, support better data-driven field reconnaissance. So teams are more knowledgeable when they get into the field. And so over the last few years, we've responded after a number of earthquakes, and we've responded in a number of different ways. Um, and Maddie's going to talk particularly about some of these uh, ways that we've responded, and I'm just going to give a brief overview of, of what are our methods and how do we actually do this virtual earthquake reconnaissance. And so we've gone over kind of, you know, why, why field reconnaissance is so important and a lot of the challenges that, that uh, field reconnaissance teams face. Um, and how BERT is able to kind of meet those challenges and alleviate a lot of those challenges for the, for the field teams. And so we do that through a number of ways. Um, we utilize social media actually a great, uh, a great amount. Um, and we, 
Um, we follow local utility companies and government organizations to get real-time information because this is how the, a lot of governments are communicating with their citizens uh, directly after a disaster. And then we connect with local seismic organizations. A lot of times um, they're sending people out into the field just days after the disaster and we can translate and kind of uh, glean information from their reports in order to better um, inform our reconnaissance teams that were, are being sent out into the field. So some examples of, of what we're able to find through social media. After the Puebla Morelos earthquake last fall in Mexico, we followed um, utility companies, um, especially water utility companies in Mexico City. We were able to find locations where pipelines were being repaired throughout the city. We were able to look at and find locations of schools that were damaged in the Chiapas region um, in order to kind of demonstrate where the schools were heavily damaged and what regions um, were most affected by the earthquake. We were able to find um, early warning statistics from the Chiapas earthquake. Um, how much time did all these regions have due to the early warning system that set up in Mexico? And earlier this year, there was an earthquake in Taiwan. There were about four or five non-ductile concrete buildings that were damaged, and we were able to find GPS locations and addresses of these, locations, of these buildings so that uh, researchers can further look into um, the, their design drawings and, and um, how they were designed and, and use that for, for their research. And so um, this social media is really able to inform us um, and then therefore re re inform reconnaissance teams before they deploy into the field where are their utility outages, exact locations, um, where are their landslides and geotechnical failure locations, and Manny's going to talk about that um, in a little bit, um, and then where exactly is there building damage. And so teams are able to get on the on the ground informed of where they're, where they're looking um, in the city and in the affected regions um, and do more data-driven reconnaissance. And again, the social media is really a platform for the, um, for the public and for the government to, to in communicate with one another. And so there's a lot of really good information that comes out of uh, social media. We definitely we do not take um, information from private users um, because that has been shown through research to be a little um, unreliable. And so, um, you know, there's challenges associated with this um, with field reconnaissance, and our virtual reconnaissance team is able to kind of alleviate a lot of those challenges um, to, to better inform and, and improve the, the science of earthquake reconnaissance. And the way that this actually works through ERI is that after a disaster occurs, we have what was called an immediate response phase, where, our, where we activate our network um, and our, our users and our, our members um, curate and, and uh, find information on very specific topics. And that immediate response phase is activated and it lasts for about 48 hours. Um, and that 48 hours is, is, is just because of about 48 hours after an earthquake, the Learning from Earthquakes Executive Committee has a phone call to decide how to respond. And so that's why, you know, we last about 48 hours and we collect the information and we're able to send that right to the LFE committee. So they can make an informed decision on the best way for ERI to respond to the earthquake. We look at topics that I listed in the previous slide. Um, our members come up with questions that a reconnaissance team might want to tackle or, or answer, um, and then provide links to media sources that are discussing this topic. And if, if ERI decides to respond even further, um, they, we go into what's called a long-term response phase. Um, this long-term is really not long-term at all. It's about one to two months. Um, but uh, that, that's where we kind of um, Curate the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute Clearinghouse website. Um, we help the deployment of reconnaissance teams by, um, help, uh, by uh, preparing them for the field, and then we coordinate with local ERI contacts, contacts on the ground um, to get information. Um, also that we can really inform the teams that are going out into the field on um, where the damaged areas are, what are, what are some um, topics of interest, and, um, and how can we help them in the field. So Maddie's going to talk about um, just one instance and, and some um, examples of, of how uh, this team has really helped um, 
geotechnical reconnaissance and found some really great information. Thanks, Erica. Um, okay, so going back to the slide reflecting what VERT has done since uh, its establishment in 2015, I've um, highlighted the 2017 Mexico City, Chiapas, and Puebla events where virtual earthquake reconnaissance team, VERT, contributed somewhat um, significantly to the findings um, related to geotechnical impacts. Um, VERT also has a summary report of those events being um, drafted as we speak, and we hope to have this report uh, published within the next um, couple of months. Um, okay. So the magnitude 8.2 2017 Chiapas earthquake occurred on September 7, 2017. Um, the Chiapas earthquake affected the Oaxaca and Chiapas areas and triggered uh, the early warning signal in Mexico City. Um, the magnitude 7.1 Puebla earthquake occurred uh, 12 days after Chiapas and affected areas near uh, 120 kilometers southeast of Mexico City and 60 kilometers southwest of Puebla, Mexico. Um, after these earthquakes, VERT was activated initially for an immediate response phase to gather information um, so that the ERI learning from earthquake executive committee could make a decision on, on um, how to respond to this disaster. Um, this phase of the, of the VERT response gathered um, information on schools, Guatemala City buildings, uh, performance of retrofitted uh, buildings, lifelines, uh, dams, response in social media, early, early warning system, and um, geotechnical impact. Here is a summary of VERT uh, findings related to the Chiapas and Puebla earthquakes. Um, VERT reported that areas of uh, Tlalpan, Tlahuac, Iztapalalpa, Oaxaca, Puebla, Morelos, and Guerrero suffered um, the most of damage relating to geotechnical impacts. VERT uh, further identified the following overview of the type of, ge type of geotechnical damage. Um, tilting buildings in the areas of Tlahuac, Iztapalapa, and um, Iztacalco, highway damage in Morelos, specifically the Sun Highway, landslides and rock slides near the border of uh, Puebla and Oaxaca, and uh, Cerro de la Cruz, um, ground surface cra cracks, uh, ground movement and movement of speed bumps in Morelos, Iztapalapa, and near Colonia del Mar in Tlahuac. Um, and lateral movement of the ground near Tlahuac, Mexico City, as well as sinkholes and potential liquefaction near Iztapalapa. Um, VERT uh, further listed approximate locations of um, potential sites of interest. These coordinates were marked in uh, Google Maps and Google Earth and uh, were further categorized based on the geotechnical type of damage uh, for potential field reconnaissance. These points were mostly re related to building damage, landslides, and um, ground damage, such as ground surface uh, cracks. Um, for sake of this presentation, uh, we will only cover comparison of vert and gear findings pertaining to ground damage and building damage. Um, according to the gear reconnaissance report, by Mayoral, Mayoral et al. 2017. Um, the neighborhood of Colonia del Mar um, suffered uh, from excessive ground sub subsidence of up to one meter, and numerous ground cracks were observed. Were observed. Um, they also summarized the surface cracks and ground damage, such as settlement, tilt, 
or uh, lateral movements in a table using a ground damage index. Um, and using that, they identified nine damage points around the area of Colonia del Mar. These nine points, along with the vert approximate locations of um, damage pertaining to ground deformations, are shown um, on this slide. The smaller circles in black and white uh, are taken from the gear reconnaissance report. Uh, that's table 4.5 um, of, of that report summarizing latitudes and log longitudinal coordinates. And then these points um, outline locations where excessive uh, surface cracks uh, were observed. Larger circles in blue reflect vert findings on coordinates of interest um, to field reconnaissance teams regarding uh, ground damage in the area of Colonia del Mar. Um, we used the coordinates reported by vert and found that the vert estimate of locations with um, surface crack is as close as 140 meters. That's about 450 feet um, um, to, the, to the north and about 200 meters uh, or about 900 feet to the, um, basically compared to the gear points um, of damage. So now uh, we'll cover the comparison um, pertaining to building damage. Civil Engineering Brigade uh, inspections created maps of building damage for four zones, which were of predominant interest. And you can see these four zones in, in white, or rather uh, light gray in this figure. Um, these data tagged about 300 buildings as either being collapsed or being high-risk buildings. This is based on the gear report by Mayor Rolletal, 2017. The four uh, predominant zones of inspection show a map of buildings with um, high risk, which are shown in red, and the ones of uncertain security in, in yellow. Uh, we can see that there are some regions where heavy damage was reported by the UNAM gear team. Uh, again, these are the red and yellow marks and that they were not included in the four zones of inspection. Vert also successfully identified zones of damage to buildings, um, and these points are shown in light blue circles. Both uh, gear and vert efforts reported heavy damage in the area of Tlahuac, which was not included in the zones of coverage by the Civil Engineering Brigade inspections. Uh, as we can see, the coordinates of damaged buildings are very close to the buildings uh, reported of having high risk in the gear report. So uh, by the time we were uploading our presentation, we didn't have, um, we didn't know much about um, the extent of Hurricane Lane. Uh, so this is not in our slides, but we are also currently planning to activate VERTS for Hurricane Lane and should be activating as soon as this weekend. So those of you interested in hurricane-related damage and contributing to VERT, please uh, feel free to contact us. Here is also a list of references that we use for the materials um, presented in this webinar. Um, please Note that Erica and I have also submitted an article uh, on this topic as well, which is uh, currently under review. We'll be happy to answer any questions. So thank you, Manny and Erica, for your presentation. We have one question, and is that do the ERI reconnaissance teams coordinate with the gear reconnaissance teams? Sure. So I'm going to take um, over answering that question. Um, so after the Chiapas and Pueblo earthquakes, uh, there was a joint effort between the GEAR and uh, UNAM, um, the two teams of advanced team. And there was, there was two teams, one uh, named uh, advanced team and one main team. Uh, they were established to perform field reconnaissance associated uh, to the Pueblo earthquake. The advance team was launched in between September 24th. Um, that's five days after Pueblo and about 17 days after Chiapas earthquakes. 
The main team was launched immediately after the return of the advanced team on, on September 30th, um, 2017. There was a request a few days before launching the GEAR advanced team uh, for VERT to further investigate geotechnical impacts and identify damages uh, relating to settled and tilted buildings, cracked buildings um, due to ground deformations and slope deformations and landslides. So to answer your question, yes, uh, this was perhaps the first uh, collaboration between VERT and GEAR. Okay, thank you so much again for your wonderful presentation. And we're going to move on to our next presenter. She is Olga Catenido. She is an associate researcher at the National Observatory of Athens, Greece. She holds a diploma in civil engineering from an, um, a Master of Science in Soil Mechanics and Engineering Seismology and a PhD in Engineering Seismology. She has been a visiting researcher at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, a postdoctoral researcher at the French Institute for Radi Radiological Protection and Nuclear Safety and the Institute of Earth Sciences of the Université Joseph Fourier at Grenoble, and a visiting researcher at the Disaster Prevention Research Institute in Kyoto University, and the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center of the University of California, Berkeley, as well. She worked as a senior researcher at the GFC German Research Center for Geosciences, and she was a senior lecturer at the University of Greenwich at the UK. Her research focuses on seismic hazard and ground motion, in particular site response, high frequency attenuation, and ground motion uncertainty. She has served as panel expert and acted as, as a consultant on several probabilistic seismic hazard assessment projects in the energy sector in the U.S. and Switzerland. She has co-authored 16 journal publications, 25 conference papers, 35 standalone abstracts, and given 14 invited lectures. She has served as a reviewer for 13 international journals to conferences and the EPSRC UK grant scheme. She has co-organized five special sessions and at international conferences. She is fluent in Greek, English, Spanish, and French. So after this great biography, I am introducing Dr. Olga Joan Catenido. Hello. Yeah, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hello. Thank you, Ashley, okay. for the introduction. I'm just trying to get the selection going. It's a little slow in loading, so forgive me. So after this long introduction, I need to also introduce the other team members. So uh, this is... Um, uh, Basically, I'm only presenting uh, what uh, the team has done. And I don't know if you can see my slides. I'm a bit worried because I can't right now. Ash, could you please confirm? I am moving your presentation. Do you see it now? Hello? Yes, okay, uh, I can see it, so hopefully the audience can see it too. So uh, this is uh, joint work with Dr. Vadelina Garini, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the National uh, Technical Union in Athens, Greece. Uh, Dr. Guillermo Rios Van Panos, uh, who is an engineer with uh, Geographic Engineer with WSP New York. Dr. Susie Nicolau, who's a principal engineer with WSP again, and Professor George Gazetas, again from the National Technical University of Athens. So this is by no means such a holistic approach as the wonderful presentation we saw before. It is uh, an effort to give you uh, a bit of a taste of some of the issues we encountered uh, with our earthquake, uh, recon post earthquake reconnaissance uh, in Mexico City. So this was a primarily um, 
structural oriented um, reconnaissance led by the Applied Technology Council of the U.S. And the seismological and geotechnical aspects um, I will uh, tell you about uh, uh, basically the, the, the geotechnical bit that came out of it. So we structured the presentation in uh, two parts. So one is to give you a taste of some of the geotechnical observations we found uh, while, as I said, basically looking at structural damage. And the second part is related to the signal processing of the ground motions that we obtained from the mission. The reason behind that being that uh, this being a, a joint group of engineers and seismologists, we discovered how very different the approaches uh, that different um, communities use are. So to kick into that, I'll just start with an overview of the Mexican earthquake. So uh, I'm sure all of you are um, well aware of the geo well, geological and tectonic context of Mexico. So it's a very high seismicity area owing also to uh, the Middle American Trench, which runs along its southern coast, uh, which is basically a, uh, a subduction zone. And you can see where a lot of earthquakes happen along that trench, and the ones we are um, going to talk about all come from there. Uh, we, we all know the 1985 um, Great Guerrero Michoacan earthquake, um, which basically instigated the era of side effects, so I'm sure everybody knows that. Uh, that came from around here, so offshore close to the trench. The ones we are um, talking about today are the 2017 September ones coming almost uh, 20, uh, 32 years later, almost to the date. So the magnitude 8, which was offshore, is not going to um, be our focus today, but the smaller magnitude 7 is, of course, because of the great damage. Uh, so that took place around the Cocos Plate, um, around 15 uh, kilometers depth. I'll quickly skip through the, some of the seismological slides on aftershocks because um, the slides seem to be loading very slowly. I apologize for that. In terms of ground motion intensity, about a million people felt very strong shaking and about 15 million felt strong shaking, according to the USGS. And hopefully you can see the, the map visualizing now. I'm sorry, this is taking too long. I don't know what's wrong. So hopefully I'm back with you. It seems to be okay now. So when thinking of Mexico, the big thing most of us think of, of course, is the geotechnical context. This is a map showing a correlation of the failures in buildings, red being collapsed with a spectral acceleration at one second uh, as recorded uh, for the 7.1 Pueblo Morelos earthquake. And uh, you're probably all aware of the context uh, in terms of geology in Mexico. So uh, to the left hand side, the light gray is what you call the hill area. Inside, you have the lake, and where all the damage is concentrated is the transition zone. Because Mexico is built on an ancient lake, which by now is most of it is drained, but it was left behind. 
is very deep and extremely soft deposits of uh, rapid drying clay with very high plasticity index and high water content, which basically means very strong settlement. And everybody, anybody who's been to Mexico City can tell you that there's no end to the differential settlements and the totals of the building. Uh, the other um, characteristic of this material is a very low um, shear wave velocity, leading to very strong amplifications from rock to soil, in conjunction with the lack of nonlinearity, which gives uh, well gives this pretty low damping. So this creates the strong settlements and very strong ground motions. Those are the things we had in mind during the reconnaissance. So hopefully you can now see the size advancing normally. Um, one of the very famous recording stations, which is actually pretty representative of uh, a lot of the sites we visited, is the um, STC <coughs> station, which lies on um, around 40 meters of this very soft um, clay. And then that on top of rock, if you want to simulate it very simply and one dimensionally. And this is what you see on the left hand side in terms of spectral acceleration. Um, with respect to the famous UNAM station, uh, which lies on rock, so rock is your blue lines, and they think is the soil. And what this is trying to show is basically the very, very strong amplification um, observed both uh, in the 1985 earthquake and the recent one <coughs> in the vicinity of 1.5 to 2 seconds. And that is uh, directly related to the soil profile there. So what this caused um, in these earthquakes is basically the concentration of collapses for structures with a particular number of stories, roughly 8 to 12 stories, whereas shorter and taller structures remained more intact. And we can, there's a little more info on that about um, related to the cracking of the buildings, but this, I think, if there's time in the end, I'll go into it then. So this brings us to the geotechnical observations in situ. So the Applied Technology Council visited uh, a great variety of buildings throughout the Mexican capital. There are two which I'll talk to you a little bit about. And both of them, as you can see, lie close to this transition zone. And the SCT profile I just showed you um, corresponds roughly to the profile we have for building number two, which is the lower one, the Amsterdam one, and the one I'll tell you about first. The one we'll see later on, the Dr. Lucia, which is on top, the taller buildings, that corresponds to a soil profile a little deeper than that, so longer periods, basically, so more than two seconds. So the Amsterdam building, we were actually there to instrument a perfectly healthy building, but we were called in by the residents and managed to find out about um, the problems there. So this building uh, had no structural damage. Uh, it basically rotated by as much as five degrees as a rigid block. And you can see on the right-hand side how the um, structural joint between the tilting and the normal standing building has uh, opened because of that. So the reason for this was differential settlements in the underlying um, soft clay. The building which tilted was uh, much older than the newer one. We did not have information about the foundation, but it is likely that the newer one also has deeper foundations. I'm sorry, the problem with this slide is repeating itself, so I don't know what you can see. 
On the inside, what we were able to see was very systematic um, diagonal uh, cracks in all of the infills, in all of the walls, which indicated very clearly the direction of the rotation and corroborated the picture we had from the outside of the building as well as the measurements of the coating that we took. And this building is still inhabited despite the, the really strong coating. The second building um, I will talk to you about is not inhabited. This was a much taller structure, 15 as opposed to 5 stories. And what happened there is that we had uh, two or three cross-shaped buildings which were made up of two L-shaped buildings joined through the staircase, as you can see here. We were able to inspect from the outside uh, around most of the building and take measurements of the uplifts and uh, the settlements, uh, which were up to 10 to 20, 25 centimeters tops. But what this caused was uh, much, much stronger than that. First, I'll show you a few pictures from the outside. You can see here the uplift of the building and how it's broken the pavement. And on the bottom, on the middle of the bottom picture, how this is also led to the breaking of a column. I'll show you a few more pictures of the outside of the building. So this is a roughly 10 centimeter uplift of the foundation there. Some tilting of the outside walls, if it will read. Breaking in the pavement. And the result, in terms of the building of all of this, is this separation between the two L-shaped parts. So you cannot see it very clearly in the picture, only because we have tried to basically cover it with temporary panels. But at the top of the 16 stories, it's about one meter. So this tilt of the building has caused the separation, and we were able um, to accompany uh, an official uh, government group uh, in entering the building. So I'll be able to show you a few of the pictures from the inside as we walked up the staircase. So the pictures will basically show you how going further up the two buildings are coming farther and farther apart. So this is the first floor, and already you can notice that the last step has broken off the staircase, so we have separation in both directions, vertical and horizontal, around 10 centimeters. The picture changes very fast, unlike my slides, I must say, walking up the building, so already in the third floor, you can see stronger separations, and on the right-hand side, the two buildings coming apart. Seventh floor, it becomes much stronger, so we have dozens of centimeters of separation in all senses, and the last the story that we visited, um, but without taking any more measurements, was the 15th. So we don't have an exact measurement because it, the visit there lasted very, very few seconds, but it's about one meter. I hope it will load so you can see it. Thanks. I think I 
we'll skip the second building because the picture is the same and this is eating out of the precious time we've had. This is the, the only picture I'll show you from the second building. So very similar situation. Part one and part two have broken out and I'll dedicate the remaining time to part B, which is uh, insights into the signal processing, and I told you why we wanted to give this some special attention, although it's by no means a new research topic, but when it comes to reconnaissance and geotechnical engineering, um, we have noticed that communities tend to process data in different ways, so we wanted to highlight some of the critical issues that we found with this effort that we made here. Um, if anybody could help me load slide 33, I don't know if my connection is strong enough. We are on slide 33. Okay, thank you. So uh, the goal was to get hold of and process Ground motions from the authorities there. We did so from the university and the uh, instrumentation center. So we had around 70 odd recordings that we processed. And the goal was to um, manage uh, to win the trade off between maintaining the PGA and producing velocity and displacement traces which would be admissible. So the first part, uh, of course, of um, any signal processing is to correct and filter. The output we wanted to produce was uh, response spectra and time histories uh, corrected appropriately and filtered appropriately so that the end user would be able to use these without needing any seismological background knowledge. So the first thing you would do would be to detrend and demean your recording. And then what we did was we looked at each and every record trying to look, separate um, noise and strong motion parts. So this should be slide 37. Thank you. Uh, the reason behind this is we want to be able to use the frequency band that is uh, all of it that is available, but also uh, none of uh, what should not be used. So the way to do that was to look at the Fourier spectra, so the spectral domain, and we had to choose a threshold, so the threshold for signal to noise was around three, and anything outside of that had to be thrown away, so that's how we chose our upper and, uh, and lower um, filter corners. You need to forgive me because I cannot see my slides anymore at all. I'm just counting on the audience being able to see them. So as you can see, for this recording, for example, we can look down at pretty low frequencies, but the high frequencies, which you would normally cut at even 30 hertz, we cannot see anything above um, 10 or 11, so this all has to go away. This was a record-to-record -record procedure. If you have a look at slide 40, uh, you can see the great variability between the upper and lower um, cutoff frequencies. And the variability of the available frequency was really strong, so between 10 and 40. This is basically showing you why it is not okay to follow the standard procedure of fixing one lower and one higher frequency. Waiting for it to move on. We chose to cut off pretty strongly with uh, four poles. This is typically something that uh, engineering communities will do pretty freely. You can see here the difference between the different numbers of poles. 
in slide 43 shows you an idea of why the studious procedure is so important. This is exactly the same earthquake recorded as two sites, one low noise and one high noise. And you can see that where you can have actual reliable data out to 20, 20 something hertz on one, you can't get more than 10 for the other, which basically means that if we were to draw a line and just fix our upper limit, then we would be producing time series and ultimately the response spectra for end user use, which would include uh, about 10 hertz of what is practically rubbish on the top record uh, between 10 and 20 hertz, for example. So moving on to the next slide. <coughs> The problem with this is that we need to, as I said, keep track of PGA as well as the filters. So in slide 45, you can see that uh, the PGA depends a lot on the number of passes, which is the other decision aside from polls that we need to make. So we use two passes, whereas most uh, groups will tend to use one. Using one pass will provide very nice-looking displacements and velocity, but will give very problematic PGAs at times. On the top right side, you can see how a PGA of one component around 75 gal can increase um, almost magically to 94 gal. So when uh, filtering and cutting out energy from high frequencies, if this leads to an increased PGA, then this means that the signal processing is quite unacceptable. So this is one um, key thing to look out for. And the other one you can see in the next slide. our acceleration, we double integrate uh, to get to the displacement. The problem is that uh, if we don't check the low frequencies well enough, which is why I was trying to make the point of the noise effect, what we will get is what you see in slide 49, please, which is very funny tendencies in the, sorry, 49. Thank you. In the velocity, the ultimately uh, the displacement. And if I could have uh, slide 50, please. This is here to show you that this problem is strictly record to record. So for everyone, you need to find the magic number for which the, the effect will be minimized. So if we can move to the next one, and with my sincere apologies about the internet problem, which has severely uh, taken from the, the information I was hoping to uh, give the audience, and I need to conclude with uh, just a summary. We tried to give you a very brief flavor of the two main things, the field job, a few of the geotechnical observations on site, and the desk job, a few of the salient problems and features we found and stumbled across while doing the signal processing and offering this as a recommendation for future. And if I can have the last few slides, please. This is just to acknowledge the references and the first one. In slide 52, you should be able to see the reference for the Applied Technology Council report, which should soon, soon be out. And slide 53 should hopefully give you our acknowledgments and funding sources 
and thank you for your attention. Thank you, and I am sorry for this terrible, terrible experience with the Internet connection. Thank you, Dr. Catanido. Um, we are very sorry for the technical inconveniences, but we were able to rest a bit of your presentation. We have many questions on our Q&A window, okay, however. Even then, I can try to answer by email because I'm afraid I have already eaten out of the time of the... Yes. Yes, that's exactly what we're so we'll we'll trying to do. Like that is to save the questions from the audience, which I can see now. Thank you. Yes. yes. So we're going to follow to our next presenter. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Catanido, for your presentation, and I'll definitely follow up with the email. Thank you. Thank so you. our next presenter is Dr. Oswaldo Padilla from the Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas, which is the University of the Army in Ecuador. Dr. Oswaldo Padilla Almeida is a geographer, a specialist on geographic information systems and remote sensing. He has been a faculty member in the Escuela Politécnica del Ejército, as I said, uh, a school of the Army in Sal Salgolqui, Ecuador, for almost 25 years. He has a PhD from the University of Alcala in Spain in cartography, GIS, and teledetection. Today he's going to talk about the usage of GI, um, geographic information technologies to support reconnaissance efforts in the aftermath of the April 16, 2016 Ecuador earthquake. And with further, without further notice, I would like to call Dr. Parilla so he join us in his presentation. Oswaldo? Okay, thank you very much. This is Anna Gabriela Harris. Today I will have help Oswaldo since he's having uh, a problem. So um, today okay. we are Welcome, the research of, okay, thank you. <laughs> The usage of uh, geographic information technologies to support reconnaissance efforts in the aftermath of the April 16, 2016 Ecuador earthquake. The greatest disasters that could occur have not yet occurred. That is how the Global Assessment Report on Disaster Reduction 2015 starts in a document from the United Nations. The effects of natural hazards have been responsible for the deaths of millions of people in the last two centuries around the world, destroying a wide variety of infrastructure and causing changes at the local and global level. Because geospatial information technology is considered Necessary for risk management, the need for more efficient collaboration between providers and end users of data has increased, especially when there are emerging situations, making it necessary to obtain immediate response information. So it is important to support this assessment by obtaining collaborative data and it is also important to know how to use this information in the early analysis of damages to support the response for immediate help to the population. The earthquake that occurred on the Ecuadorian coast registered on Saturday, April 16, 2016 at 6.58 p.m. local time with a magnitude of 8.7, has been the most destructive earthquake in the southern South America during the last two decades. It is the strongest earthquake in the country since the earthquake in Colombia in 1979 and the fourth largest in magnitude in 2016. The seismic wave reached the southwest of Colombia and um, it was felt in cities of that country and the northern border of Peru. The earthquake occurred as a result of the displacement between two tectonic plates, the oceanic uh, Nazca plate, which submerges under the Caribbean and South American continental plate. The movement is known as the subduction process, and it is the same that was behind the earthquake in Ecuador on January 31st, 1906. 
which uh, with a magnitude of 8.8, is uh, one of the most important um, earthquakes all around the world and the largest recorded in our country. The epicenter of this earthquake was located in front of Pedernales, uh, the province of Manabí, 20 kilometers uh, uh, deep, leaving some um, 663 deadly victims and more than 2,000 injured people. The state of emergency was uh, declared at national level, and the state of exceptional emergency was declared in six coastal provinces. According to the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, more than one million people were affected by the earthquake. After the earthquake, cities like Puerto Viejo, Manta, Chone, Monte Cristi, Bahia de Caracas, Roca Fuerte, Calceta, Puerto Lopez, Pedernales, and other cities were affected. In Manta, the second most important port in the country, Several buildings collapsed, including the control tower storage of the Loya Faro International Airport. Also, many people died in these cities, and um, in addition, people had to deal with long hours without electricity and drinking water. And experts from the USGS did not complete bags below the continental plate at a speed of 61 millimeters per year. The study of seismic weight reveals that what we call focal mechanism responds to the displacement of an inverse fault, a phenomenon that began in front of Pedernales and went south, causing the air to tremble. This, according to the study of aftershocks after the earthquake in Ecuador. It is uh, this displacement that generated the earthquake. The work with the high precision GPS signal showed that this region was going through a process of increasing energy accumulation. The risk assessment is a priority for the sustainable development of any country, which can be supported by the use of geospatial information technology such as geographic information systems, remote sensing, digital photogrammetry, obtaining information through the use of drones and geodesy, among others. Information technology are highly used tools within the border field of information technology aimed at the study of the territory. As other technologies, they arise from the need of society to obtain immediate responses to different problems. But in this case, they focus on the space environment. A new contribution provided by the geographic information technology is related to the fact that geoinformation can be visualized and obtained almost immediately, being available to, to make an immediate decision on those areas affected by disaster. In risk management, it is vital to have georeference information to be able to give immediate answers to the different layers of information on the same territory, meaning population, climate, pathology, climatology, among others. The geographic information technology are tools that manage these layers and allow a better visualization of the real world, showing the existing relationship between their parameters, in particular between men and natural disasters. Risk management is a priority for the sustainable development of any country. In Ecuador, the project National Plan of Good Living 2013-2017, which shows the priorities in this issue, indicates um, in its objectives 3.11, the following, that uh, it is necessary to warranty the preservation and integral protection of the cultural and natural heritage and of the citizenship in the face of threats and risks of natural or anthropic origin. And in objective 7.12, literal F, it expresses the need, the need to strengthen the 
institutional mechanisms to manage natural and anthropic risks in a timely manner. Considering the vulnerability condition of the ecosystems of the territories under the special regime and the Amazon. Um, and these priorities can be supported by the use of geospatial information technology, such as geographic information systems, remote sensing, cartography, digital photogrammetry, obtaining geoinformation through the use of drones, spatial data infrastructure, geographic visualization, geodesy, among others. Throughout the world, Human settlements are exposed to disaster and natural hazard caused by phenomena um, produced by nature. But uh, they are more harmful when they occur in areas associated with conditions of vulnerability, such as high rates of uh, poverty, lack of an adequate basic service distribution network like energy or water, or, um, and poor health infrastructure, etc. In these types of areas, the most affected by the April 16th earthquake in Ecuador. Now, the use of geographic information and geotechnology play a fundamental role in the different stages of risk management, like uh, prevention, planning and preparation, mitigation, uh, humanitarian aid, early recovery, and also transition between emergency humanitarian aid and long-term recovery. In Ecuador, all these activities were complemented by the structural diagnosis that uh, was developed in the affected area, which was immediately carried out by the personnel of the Army Corps of Engineers of Ecuador, trained for this type of uh, task which allowed for a very early analysis on the situation for different buildings, which could collapse and endanger people. Now, let's talk about remote sensing. When looking to study the Earth's surface without coming into contact with it to inventory its resources and determine the phenomena that occur on it, we rely on remote sensing which is the study of the environment uh, remotely. There are several data sources for the study and application of remote sensing, such as satellite platforms and aerial platforms. These data cover from um, extensive areas to very limited areas. In relatively short time, think just the beginning of uh, what is known as the Charter International, which is an initiative that aims to offer information and spatial data in a unified way from the main satellite platforms in mitigating the effects on the population. In the case of uh, the April 16, 2016 earthquake in Ecuador, images were taken from the worldwide view platform in the area of Pedernales, Chamanga, and Esmeralda from Digital Globe on uh, April 18, 2016, with a spatial resolution of 30 centimeters. Here you can clearly see some uh, buildings that are before and after the event when compared with the previous slide. This helps to determine which sites were the most critical at the moment to provide immediately humanitarian aid, and um, in addition to performing a damage analysis and early response needs. These images were obtained through the Charter International, that is free of charge, which allowed for the necessary, the necessary, the necessary analysis. Sorry. The um, images were also used to determine the possible damage to the road infrastructure for the purpose of accessibility to the affected area. In this case, having areas where there were no images before the April 16, 2016 event, we used Google Street View, 
which allowed us to have a view of the site before the earthquake and compare it with the high resolution image after the earthquake event, which allowed us also, in addition, to have an assessment of the affected areas and their distance in um, meters from the road. Now, you always uh, be, uh, have uh, become a very common source of data collection as a complementary method using conventional remote sensing. Its great advantage is the ability to take rapid response information in emergency situations, being able to access sites affected by a natural phenomenon almost immediately, as well as its scope, speed of processing, and low cost. In the case of the Ecuador earthquake, it was possible to obtain photography mosaics and elevation models of the main affected population in the provinces of Manabí and Esmeralda through UAB Volunteers Ecuador. This, was, uh, this has become a real early response to support the risk management process which allows for an analysis of damages and needs of the affected area. Some of the areas were processed in the laboratory and uh, of our universities, such as the Chamanga area and Puerto Viejo, among others. By covering different areas using the UAB equipment of the group of trained volunteers Photography mosaics of very high resolution uh, were obtained, reaching in some cases 10 centimeters and higher. Resolution that actually was not necessary since the rapid diagnosis was required. And these results imply more uh, photography images, images and more processing. So the, the photographs were reduced to 30 centimeters resolution. In this slide, you can see the high level of detail that was achieved in some areas, like this case showing an urban area of the city of Puerto Viejo. In this graph, you can see a recreation area of the same city of Puerto Viejo, where you can also observe very clear details, such as the pedestrian paths, groups of some small structures, vegetation, and some bodies of water. This is a photographic shot of the Puerto Viejo Central Park. We uh, show it to see the level of detail that can be achieved with a UAV data collection. It was taken a few days after the event. One of the advantages of this uh, type of equipment is the accessibility that you have to areas that were affected almost immediately. In this slide, taken during the same days of the previous uh, photographs in uh, Puerto Viejo, you can already observe damages in buildings, which have totally collapsed, as can be seen in the right central part of the photographic mosaic. This uh, helps to determine what kind of building it is, its uh, degree of damage, and to determine critical areas for rapid response. Um, here in this slide, you can see some buildings that have suffered serious uh, damages that uh, have partially and totally collapsed. But something that uh, draws the attention here are some buildings with a wooden structure and um, with steam roofs that have resisted the event. Um, and this is uh, precisely because of these flexible structures that allow to in the event in a better way than uh, non ductile uh, rainforest concrete buildings. In this image, um, you can observe buildings similar to the previous ones that collapsed in Puerto Viejo. Some of them are to five stories high, just by means of a quick analogy of the covered area of the rubble and the volume that it can be calculated to the digital model of elevation generated from the same data collection source from UID. 
In this image, the degree of damage is much larger, and it corresponds to areas with greater vulnerability and construction that were not built with technical regulations to reduce the metric. Here you can also appreciate machinery that was already in the area for debris removal activities to rescue victims. Please uh, know that the these images were taken by the volunteers who had this equipment and were um, later processed in the laboratories of our university. This um, photograph is mostly uh, clearly shows the machinery that uh, is removing debris from a building that completely collapsed. This helps later to make a diagnosis of economic losses and buildings and in buildings and homes. And um, then we were able to compare them with the cadastral data of the municipality of Puerto Viejo. Um, now let's talk about the drones. Uh, so drone photogrammetry allows the generation of precise digital terrain and uh, surface models. The documents that are generated are outputs corresponding to the generated point to the cloud, the 3D mesh, and uh, the orthophoto and the digital terrain model. An example of the generated data can be seen in this slide which represents both the digital terrain model and the generated art photo. With the uh, high resolution, resolution sorry, of an area of the city of Puerto Viejo. In the lower part, you can see the river of the same name of the city and some bridges that cross over it. Now let's talk about the eruption. The most striking technique of using satellite images in the study of earthquake, earthquake is called uh, LIDAR. It is uh, defined as the result of integration, GPS technologies, inertial measurement units, and uh, laser sensors, which is used for the collection of altitude data. These data are used to define the terrain surface and generate digital elevation models. The LiDAR survey has uh, advantages over capturing and data with conventional methods. It uh, requires minimum geodetic control on the land, and the data has a higher density and rated precision. As um, indicated, one of its main products are elevation models. Information of great utility for disaster prevention and support because it shows the altitude of each point of the territory and it allows the definition of areas affected by the seismic event. Indeed, the um, availability of sensors mounted on UID was very useful to analyze the effects of the earthquake on uh, April 16, 2016 in Ecuador. In this image, it was possible to recreate a terrain model obtained by means of the LiDAR technique transported on UAV from the Chamanga area, one of the most affected and vulnerable areas of the coast. Um, due to the importance and relevance of the information generated by groups of volunteers and officials from different public institutions, the data were centralized in the Military Geographic Institute of Ecuador, which also generated a large amount of data. This information has to be initially analyzed and saved in um, geodatabase for its later use, in addition to generating a repository that is located in the web page of the Military Geographic Institute, which can be accessed freely for any type of research and subsequent analysis. As a result of the growing awareness of the usefulness of uh, geographic information techniques in risk management and risk assessment, international collaboration mechanisms for the delivery of geospatial data by global initiatives were established. Collaborative uh, cartography or voluntary geography 
is uh, define as their participation a volunteer art source. Sometimes with no previous cartographic training, with the aim of generating cartography and georeferent data collection published later on pre-nation platform, platforms such as geoportals. One of the most interesting, interesting initiatives is carried out by the humanitarian team of uh, Open Street Map, HOT team, which uh, with the volunteers have, uh, have generated cartography of immediate response in the case of a uh, catastrophic event that affects any part of the world. In the case of Ecuador, with the event that uh, took place in April 16, in a matter of hours, most of the areas affected by the echo were generated with high quality and detail, which is subsequently helped to make an assessment of damages and needs and to obtain a comparison of the areas before and after the event. Uh, well, finally, in the last uh, event, the National Security of Planning uh, and Development, the Secretary of uh, Risk Management, the Mediterranean, a geographic Institute, together with the Mapping Ecuador, UAD Ecuador volunteers, formed by the public and private initiatives and universities, such as the University of the Armed Forces, Latin DOSP, and the University of Cuenca, the Lab, among others, in addition to volunteers worldwide who are updating the mapping of the affected areas on the OSN platform, all work united in an initiative for the elevation of damages in emergency response. And um, with this, we would like to thank for your attention, and if you have any questions, we would love to answer them. Thank you. So we have two more minutes for questions. If anyone of you is interested to ask some of the questions for Ana Gabriela, please type it on the Q&A window. So I guess mm -hmm. everything was really clear, Ana Gabriela, so nobody is asking for questions. So okay, we thank want you very to much. thank you all. We want to thank you all for attending the 2018 Earthquake Engineering and Soil Dynamics Web Conference. We want to thank once again our gold sponsor, Keller. The connected companies of Keller in North America are uniquely positioned to handle the most complex geotechnical construction projects nationwide. By including all services in one contract, we reduce client risk and ensure all aspects of a project are met on time and on budget. So we hope you have a really good afternoon and thank you for attending today's session.